Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Gregoire, and I am the Legislative Director of your New York State Association of Counties, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Pat Cummings, NISAC Council. On behalf of our President, Jack Marin, and Executive Director, Stephen Aquario, I want to thank you for joining us this morning for our second day of our virtual fall seminar and a workshop this morning about Executive Order 203 and the Police Reform and Collaborative Initiative. Our 2020 virtual fall seminar is taking place from September 15th through the end of September and includes nearly 20 workshops and meetings designed to bring the latest information on issues facing today's county leaders. We thank you for joining us as we move hashtag counties forward together. And thanks um, for everyone for participating with us. We're encouraging everyone to show their participation in the fall seminar by joining our virtual contest for a chance to win from uh, prizes from our sponsors. For those of you on Twitter, we have the weekly tweet off and whoever tweets the most time throughout this week using the hashtag counties forward together will win a prize from a sponsor. This week's prize sponsor will be providing a JBL Bluetooth speaker, so don't forget to participate for a chance to win. For those of you on Instagram, we're hosting a Counties Forward Together photo contest. To participate, simply post a photo about how your county is moving forward with the hashtag Counties Forward Together and tag us at NYS Counties. A winning photo will be selected at the end of the conference and will also win a prize from a sponsor. And lastly, we have a perfect attendance award drawing in which one of the fall seminar participants with perfect workshop attendance will be selected at random for a prize from a sponsor. So if you joined us yesterday for the elections workshop in the morning and the budget workshop in the afternoon, uh, and then again this morning, you are on your way for a perfect attendance award. At this time, I'd also like to thank our sponsor for this morning's webinar, the MTX Group, for sponsoring this session. MTX is a global cloud implementation partner enabling public sector organizations with expertise across various platforms and technologies, including Google Cloud, Salesforce, artificial intelligence slash machine learning, data integration, analytics, and mobile technology. MTX has implemented many innovative solutions for public agencies across New York State and recently deployed a community engagement app for the New York Police Department with the goal of building relationships, trust, and transparency among residents. Before we begin this workshop and before I introduce our speakers, we're going to now share a brief three-minute video to help you get to know a little bit more about MTX. Imagine if we can do more with less during this pandemic, especially in a time when budget is a challenge. You can absolutely count on MTX Group to help you with your, some of the IT transformation. Hi, my name is Das Noble, founder and CEO of MTX Group. MTX provides IT consulting services across the board in the United States. We currently work with a multiple agencies in New York State and New York City. And we're very much a technology agnostic partner. Our success has been rooted in the core concept of building corporate culture. And that's the biggest differentiator where we invest in people. At the end of the day, people can make or break whatever the initiative or projects that we all embark in. Because of our investment in people, we have less than 1% attrition within the organization. People enjoy working with MTX, and so does our client in the government agencies. We look forward to working with your counties and help you in your IT transformation. While we provide a number of products and services, but at the end of the day, we take the time to understand your bigger vision, your use cases, and help you find technology solutions so you can be successful. And do it in a very little time. 
We talk about bringing speed to market with quality. We like to deliver projects in weeks, not in months or years. I look forward to having conversation with your leadership team at times. And as you continue to embark, do keep in mind that there's a couple of things that I wanna highlight. First is that we have been working with NYPD in providing services in, in community policing. What it does, it increases trust between citizens, residents, and the, the police departments. There may be some potential needs with our solutions in your counties. In addition to that, I truly believe in creating a savings where the counties can come together and have a shared services. We absolutely admire this approach and would like to work on this approach where we can create some savings for the counties by delivering solutions where needed. I appreciate your time and uh, the further conversation we may have in the future. Have a wonderful day and thank you for serving our state. Again, thank you, MTX. On June 12th, 2020, Governor Cuomo signed Executive Order 203, the New York State Police Reform and Reinvention Collaborative. This executive action, coupled with the passing of the Say Their Names agenda, has dramatically altered policing in New York State. This webinar will address these new challenges and discuss questions of how counties and law enforcement agencies will adapt to the new normal. What does change look like and how are these police reforms reflective of the community need? We are joined today by two experts in this field, Carly Bolanos of Bolanos Low Law Firm and Jason Casalia, the Onondaga County Undersheriff. Carly is a founding partner of the law firm Bolanos Low PLLC. She's a veteran of labor and unemployment law, excuse me, and for over 20 years, Carly has focused extensively on public sector labor and employment law. So thank you, Carly, for joining us this morning. And I think at this time, um, I, I'll just cover some housekeeping items before I turn it over to both Carly and Jason. If you have a question throughout this presentation, please type it into the questions panel on, on your chat box. Um, we will answer these questions in the order they are received after the planned remarks from, from both Jason and Carly. And again, if you have any questions or if you encounter technical difficulties, please submit that to us and we will help you troubleshoot it. And at this time, um, I'll like, I would like to turn it over to Carly and Jason. And again, thank you both for, for joining us this morning. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, and we are delighted to be here with you all today. I do have on the screen the, oh, if you could just go back. I do have on the screen under Sheriff Castalia's uh, biography that I prepared for you all because I did want you to note a few things about his background. I have selected him as a speaker with us today because, um, in particular, his strength in the areas of policy and uh, progressive attitude toward um, reforming uh, policing and to advancing officers um, for the benefit of the officers and the public. In particular, I do want to note that Under Sheriff Castalia is the team leader for the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies, Inc., CALEA which as we move forward with the presentation, you'll begin to see how important some of these certifications and training for officers um, really proves to be. So I did just want to share with you that biography so that you had the information about um, his resume and background, but understood that he is a leader in the area of uh, police accreditation. I'll just, on the next slide, review the agenda. So what we're going to talk about today, and we're going to, under Sheriff Castellia and I are going to work on this collaboratively on each slide uh, throughout the program. So it's not as if I'm going to speak first and then he's going to speak. We're going to work together through this program so that we can provide you both the legal 
and the police expertise information for each topic that we're covering today. We're going to cover three topics. We're going to spend quite a bit of time at first on the Executive Order 203. Uh, we'll get into the details of that and talk to you about some best practices um, and what some counties are doing in particular on Indaga County. Then we're going to review nine pieces of legislation uh, that are the say the name agenda that was mentioned. And there's a tenth piece of legislation which we'll cover separately. That's the repeal of 50A, Freedom of Information Law, and all of the requests that many of you have been receiving uh, regarding uh, police records. So those are our three topics. On the next slide, we'll get started with Executive Order 203. So as was mentioned, in June, mid-June, uh, Governor Cuomo issued an executive order related specifically to policing and in response to the police-involved death that had, uh, that had become obviously quite a concern to the public. Uh, so let's get into Executive Order 203 and have us tell you what it's about and what you should be doing already, or if you haven't started, we'll be getting started on soon in terms of working on the governor's executive order. The next slide. So there's three main components of what executive order requires for your county. The first is that the government has to develop a police reform plan. And this plan must be developed with community involvement. We'll get into the details of, of that piece of it in particular. Once you create this community-involved police reform plan, you have to effectuate that plan, and that requires legislative action. And this legislative action and the planning for, for your community-involved plan must all be accomplished so that, as the third bullet shows, you submit your police reform plan to New York State by no later than April 1st, 2021. So I know many counties at this point in time have already built for themselves a timetable of the steps they need to take with respect to the executive order planning, the community involvement, when you're going to be timing the legislative action and the public comment that's involved with that legislative action, which we'll get into, by that date, April 1st, to get that submitted to the state in time. An important point to mention here is that failure to submit that to the state in a timely fashion or at all equals potential loss of funding for the police agency and or for the local government entity. So this is uh, a requirement of the executive order that it be submitted. And if it's not submitted or if it's not submitted meeting the criteria of the order, which under Sheriff Castellia and I will review, you can lose funding for your local government entity. That's very important. Um, the division of budget is supposed to work with the uh, Division of Criminal Justice Services, DCJS, to provide us with more guidance, I think, in connection with the funding component of the executive order. Under Sheriff Casalia, any comment regarding uh, this, this uh, what I've just discussed? Yes, thanks, Carly, and thanks, everyone, for, for being on the line, and I appreciate very much being here with you. It's an outstanding association. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be uh, here with Carly. Carly and I go back. I don't, I don't think I should tell them how far we go back, Carly, uh, but we go back a <laughs> long way uh, of working together through some, some, some significant issues uh, in, in specific to uh, uh, law enforcement. Uh, so many years of working together, and we still continue to collaborate uh, and, and work together to this day. Uh, we all realize that these are, are, are some, are some um, changing times. Uh, and and uh, as we examine those things and we examine specifically some of, uh, you know, the, the changes that uh, are coming out through the executive order, one of the areas that, uh, as Carly had talked about, uh, was um, the, the first connection to uh, the governor's uh, executive order saying, here, here is a here is a number of things we want from you. And if you fail to comply, uh, the the gist is, is that there is going to be some sort of reduction or connection to budget uh, as an organization that does rely on grants. Uh, so uh, we rely on grants heavily. Uh, I have a, actually a full-time deputy that manages grants within the organization and does it for other organizations within the county. Um, it's, uh, it's a situation in which that um, uh, there's some teeth in here. And, and as we look at that and we reflect on that, 
We also reflect on the call uh, that has been going on between defund and, re and reallocate. I think that uh, my first comment here is um, uh, being very careful about uh, when, when dollars go away. And, and again, we're in the trifecta, right? So the trifecta of we have COVID, which has impacted budget and the economics of the day. And then we have uh, the police reform and in, in, in the issues that are going on inside the law enforcement community, the expectations of our community to us. All of these three things acting upon each other, and it, and it all uh, uh, complicates and, and doubles down almost, if you will, uh, the, the issues that we face. So uh, when we look at um, dollars and cents, the last thing we want to do, in my professional opinion, is reduce uh, the, the, the budgets that we have in law enforcement, because in my experience, those dollars and cents come out of two direct areas. The first area is training. And the, I, I don't think we're going to get ahead by reducing our training. Uh, and, and second of all, selection. Uh, so we can get more into this as we go on. But ensuring that, uh, you know, th those monies are reallocated and, and looked at uh, it rather than, than taken away. And, and I can give you a quick uh, uh, just a personal experience. We are uh, our organization has been committed to providing implicit bias training to our members uh, on Doug County Sheriff's Office over 700 members. And we do everything from correction custody and, and the traditional law enforcement sense. So we're in the air. We're on the ground. We're on the water. Uh, we're undercover. We're doing those things. Uh, and, and we've committed to, to bringing in uh, a Ph.D. with an outstanding program out of Atlanta, a man of color. Uh, he is an outstanding presenter, uh, and he started the process of implicit bias training prior to COVID. So we were only able to get about half of our patrol folks done and how do we get them back in? And we were looking at how we're doing it and in the, you know, and, and how we're going to, to um, uh, get our folks uh, the training that they need. Well, once austerity budgets came through, where did I find that they hit first? My training budget, it got eliminated. So we had to look at creative means in which to restore monies or find monies because that's the last thing that I wanted to eliminate. So this is just a cautionary tale for you. Thank you so much. On the next slide, very briefly, uh, wanted, we wanted you to understand who is covered by this Executive Order 203 and quite clearly uh, county, deputy sheriff, um, corrections, all covered uh, by this legislation, but we do have the, the the specifics of that for you. Essentially, it's section 1.20 of the New York State Criminal Procedure Law. So that section of the law will uh, describe who is a police officer, and that's how the word is defined in the Executive Order 203, but we listed out some of the examples here for you on that slide, but uh, quite clearly, sheriffs, under sheriff, and the deputy sheriffs within your county. Um, are all covered, including, you'll know, investigators employed by the Office of the District Attorney. Um, so just uh, so that you're aware of the coverage and scope of this executive order. On the next slide, we're going to get into what um, Under Sheriff Caselli and I have broken down the executive order into four stages of work that your county government needs to perform. So we'll go through each of these stages one by one. The first stage that your county needs to be working on to be in compliance with Executive Order 203 is what Under Sheriff Casali and I refer to as the initial review. That is where each local government entity must perform a comprehensive review of current police force deployment strategies, policies, procedures, and practices. And Under Sheriff Casali provided me with some great perspective on this. So Under Sheriff, I'd ask you to share that with the group. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that most, if not all, law enforcement organizations are doing this as an, on an annual basis. But the reality is, um, A, do you do it? And B, uh, what's the manner in which do you accomplish this? Uh, so let's back up a little bit. Um, we have in law enforcement, we have what so many other uh, uh, professions uh, have is, is accreditation, a body of best practice, best policy standards that, uh, that, that right now is voluntary uh, for organizations to participate in. New York State DCJS Law Enforcement Accreditation Program, LEAP, 
uh, is is in place, has been in place for a long, long time. Those standards are about 109 standards in which that agencies have to comply with, and then they have to show compliance, demonstrate compliance over time. Um, and then there are other uh, accreditation bodies, as Carly mentioned earlier. Uh, CALEA is one of them. Uh, they have a Tier 1 and Tier 2 program, 181 standards, all the way up to 459 standards with sub bullets of over 1,100 conditions that organizations have to comply with within their written directive system. Stage one initial review is truly a, a, a comprehensive review of that organization's written directive system. And a written directive system in law enforcement, like anything really else, is the basic premise and the foundation of that organization's success. Everything else is built upon that. So a strong written directive system that's connected to best practice policies in modern law enforcement and policing is going to bring you, uh, you know, a, a manner in which that you have stronger defense against civil lawsuits, you get better support from your government officials, you have reduced risk and liability exposure, you have greater accountability within the agency, but more importantly, you have greater accountability and transparency in, in the community. And in those areas in which that are completely connected to this, as they are the premise for how an organization operates. So what I see here is New York State is saying, folks, you need to take a look at how you're doing business on the foundational level. And it sends a very strong opinion to me as a law enforcement executive uh, that, that uh, organizations in New York State need to take this very seriously. And, and I say that because um, we can go through a process of looking at a standard or a written directive that says, this is how this organization manages pursuits. But how are we doing that? Are we just looking at it through the eyes of one or two or three people within a command staff that have looked at the same material over time? Or are we exploring not only internally the ability to, to create groups or teams within our own organization that remember what we're doing here and remembering what the intent of this process is? Um, why not be able to uh, look into your organization and ask members that have different backgrounds and you look out to your members that are from underrepresented groups and you say, please join us, review these policies and procedures, how it affects one area of our community versus the other. We can have all the experts we want look at it from a technical aspect about how to do things and when to do things um, that, that maybe, um, uh, you know, understand the, the product better, whether it's a use of force specialist or an HR specialist. But what we truly need is to get it in the eyes of the folks within our organization that come from different areas that can provide us feedback on how maybe some of the things that we do are seen in, in, in the manner in which that we do them. Uh, and so there are ways in which that we can just do this process and get past it, but there are truly ways in which that we can look into this process, not only internally and be creative, but externally and look at ways in which that we could review policies from an external standpoint. And it's not just, uh, you know, when, when, when it gets to the point where we're just doing it to meet a standard or meet an executive order, again, um, that I, I have trouble with that as, as, as an executive in this business because I, I haven't been here for almost 30 years to just um, put a check mark in a box. And I think that, you know, this is connected to leadership but it's connected truly to the foundation and why I, I spent so much time on just this, just this subject is because how critical this truly is in building the rest of the program. Thank you so much. That perspective was super helpful for me and I'm glad, glad that you shared it with all of the people attending. I had a concern too, as I was beginning to meet with clients regarding the implementation of the executive order, that there really was a sense that we could just get through this part of it, that the initial review was not an important step of the process. So Under Sheriff and I really both agree that this foundation of your process is going to set the tone for whether or not you're going to be able to make true change within uh, your organization or department. And um, what I look for, I think, as important, especially when we're handling police discipline cases or other issues, our, our policies that are clear, that have been communicated, and that the officers have received training on. And so you want to look for, um, to make sure that your leadership 
um, like the under sheriff here, knows how to have best practice policy. So that takes a lot of study, research, review, and then how to take that policy and move it up through within an organization and bring upon all that diversity to it that he mentioned. It is extremely important for a police agency. I have noticed in my years of dealing with uh, police cases that are sometimes awful that uh, there's a policy problem at the beginning. There's a training problem at the beginning uh, where uh, that's where things tend to have gone wrong. So I really appreciate your perspective on that stage. We'll move to the next slide, and that's stage two. This is where after you perform that robust review, if you're taking our advice today, um, you're then moving on to develop your plan for uh, change and improvement. Uh, so stage two, uh, we've broken it down into four stages. That doesn't come out of the executive order, but just to make it understandable for you um, and for us, we've broken it down into the four stages. In this stage, the chief executive of the local government, so the county executive, the county supervisor, um, is to convene uh, with the head of the local police agency, so a sheriff, other agencies, uh, chiefs within your jurisdiction, and community stakeholders to develop, adopt, and implement uh, the recommendations resulting from a review. And that we're going to get to in a moment the different things that this executive order requires you to to review um, as you go through the process, but suffice it to say, you have to conduct this uh, review with uh, certain stakeholders um, and different elected officials. So there's a lot of different ways this can be approached. There's places where there might be some tension between uh, two electives who, you know, a county executive, a sheriff, uh, who's going to convene it, who's going to take control of it. We want to make sure we're not getting bogged down in those types of issues. And again, uh, I enjoyed listening to Under Sheriff Casalia about the approach that Onondaga uh, County is taking with respect to the development of this plan. So, Under Sheriff, if you would uh, kindly uh, share with the group what um, what is happening in Onondaga County. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, in, in law enforcement, Onondaga County, we have a very strong. Uh, uh, relationship between organizations in the district attorney's office. We have a very strong, and hence why you're here, a very strong association uh, with, in the Onondaga Chiefs. Uh, and we, we even though we have uh, up to 20 different concurrent jurisdictions and uh, different law enforcement organizations operating inside of this county, we have worked for many years to bring some standardization to a lot of critical areas, whether it's uh, communications, whether it's abuse persons unit, whether it's uh, you know uh, uh, the manner in which that we write reports in the re report writing system, which is all we do it the same way. And uh, we're also very blessed to, to have a very strong district attorney and district attorney's office that has taken the lead uh, in in uh, basically bringing all of us together and including the elected and the law enforcement organizations and kind of broke down the plan. And, 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 and he has said uh, it's very clear what he sees is that, you know, the governor is looking to provide kind of a, a, a schematic for reinventing and modernizing some police strategies and programs. And that, um, you know, from that, he didn't feel there was a need to create 20 different committees inside the same county when we do business very similarly, but we have to examine the differences and all of the issues that we have. So what we're doing is we're breaking it down into subgroups. We've invited everyone, the elected, uh, the, the, the city, Syracuse mayor, the county executive on Duck County, um, the electeds from uh, all of the different jurisdictions, the police chiefs, uh, the sheriff, uh, and, and many more. And then we just kind of started with that group and we're breaking it down into different subcommittees. So we're examining, one subcommittee is examining labor agreements. Another one's doing use of force policies, um, uh, in, uh, which would include physical arrest policies, use of appearance tickets, officer discretion and training, uh, specific to like de-escalation. And we'll talk more about that. Diversity recruitment's another one. Uh, Police and community relations, where are we when it, when it comes to that in our own community? Civilian review, review boards and uh, specialized units. Uh, we're going to have a, a review of all of our specialized units. 
Um, and also an examination of creating new units. Uh, uh, within my own organization, uh, we have a crisis intervention team. So we have deputies that are specially trained to and get uh, uh, dispatched to respond to mental health crisis issues. Uh, they have some more tools on their tool belt, so to say, that they can then work with those in crisis and stress uh, to 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 bring some different things to bear to get a successful conclusion. So we're going to look at that and how should that just be one or two or three different agencies, or can we make this a countywide process? And also, we're going to have another committee looking at the new police reform legislation. So this process, when in the, when in, the first email went out two days after the executive law was was sent. So we're already underway uh, and uh, we're pushing forward because as we all know, uh, April's right around the corner. Thank you. And there's, I'm surely there's some overlap between the stage one and stage two. So as those subcommittees are already underway in Onondaga County, Onondaga County Sheriff's Office is in a continuous review of its policies um, and trainings and so on and so forth. So those types of stage one reviews are going to be going on in the individual jurisdiction and we've got the collaborative process within stage two. So I thought that was a really interesting way to approach. If your county is not approaching it in a coordinated fashion, each individual police department or agency will need to um, be, you know, working to make sure that we're meeting the components of the plan, which are on the next slide. So you can see here, um, we listed for you the components of this plan that you're working on, whether collaboratively or as an individual jurisdiction, but these are a must. The executive order specifically said that each plan that's submitted to New York State must consider the following. So you might decide not to make changes, but you need to consider it. You're going to have to have some evidence maintained that this area was reviewed because this were, these were not um, you know, as suggestions, um, you could look at the following. These were your plan must consider the following. So um, we'll go through these uh, different areas, um, and then we'll ask the under sheriff to comment about some of these areas. So you must review evidence-based policing strategies, including but not limited to use of force and procedural justice. So obviously use of force is an important issue right now. Any studies addressing systemic racial bias or racial justice and policing, implicit bias awareness. The under sheriff mentioned that even though his training budget is cut due to the COVID cutbacks, um, that his office, the sheriff's office in Onondaga County, it feels very committed to implicit bias awareness training and so having to find the money. And that's for the issue of um, whether or not defunding is something we should actually be talking about while we're trying to improve police performance. Um, De-escalation training and practices, law enforcement assistance diversion programs, restorative justice practices, community-based outreach and conflict resolution, problem-oriented policing, hot spot policing, focused deterrence, crime prevention through environmental design, violence prevention and reduction intervention, model policies and guidelines prom promulgated by New York State Municipal Police Training Council, and standards promulgated by the New York State Law enforcement accreditation program under yes thank you I, I i always like here it is folks wait for it this is your unfunded mandate um as it uh as it's coming at you and in defunding won't help you accomplish this because um uh, as I examine uh, what we spend in training and, and focus on training and knowing it's a priority, we want to even spend more. But uh, there's a number of areas in here that, you know, I have I have concerns that 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 due to the economics of the day, we're going to be losing. Uh, we've been uh, blessed with um, shot spotter technology use inside the city. Uh, of Syracuse that's helped us do hotspot policing and problem-oriented policing. And now I understand that the, the, the funds for that are just not there. So we, we're going to have this, you know, this, this um, fight uh, internally where we're looking at it and saying, how do we overcome some of the challenges, uh, the economics of the day? And again, I say these things 
without any any focused pointing. This is about the economics of the day and where we find ourselves um, and what we need to do as an organization in the leadership capacity to start identifying how do we reallocate, what are we spending where, and how do we truly make a commitment to to these areas if, if we already have not. Um, I, I, I'm happy to say in my travels and, and what a lot of the things that I have done uh, with uh, assessing law enforcement organizations, and I would say the top 1% around the country in Canada, um, these things are things that we've been doing. Uh, and now we have to, to bring it to, to the masses. Um, de-escalation training and practices, uh, that is uh, truly at the forefront of every time one of my deputies gets in a car and goes on a call for service. De-escalation is the focus of, of uh, besides their safety uh, as a priority, is a focus of what, what we ask them to do. So we have to give them the tools to be able to do it. Um, diversion programs, I know there's, there's a lot of those things, but now we have to look at it from our perspective. What are things in which that, you know, there are things that we, we deal with a symptom of a disease that we can't necessarily fix. So what do we have to do within our community to kind of draw back to the days, the good days of community policing, um, uh, embracing some of those areas where we can say, uh, you know, folks know what they want. It used to be in law enforcement. We know what you need. We'll give you what you need. That's not the case. Folks are intelligent. They know what they want. And, and, and we have to look beyond just the words and we have to see the basic premise. So what is it that we can do uh, to be able to have the tools and ensure that we can meet not only what they need, but also what they want? So when we look at community-based outreach and conflict resolution, how are we going to achieve some of these things? Again, internally and externally, these are, uh, these are big pieces of a puzzle uh, that uh, if, if they're new to an organization, a law enforcement organization that, that you're connected with, they're going to need support because these are not easy, quick fixes. And if they do, you know what they say about things being easy. Uh, are they truly going to help you uh, invest in your personnel so that you get what really truly the intent of this is, which is uh, the ability to, to meet some higher standards and bring about some culture change within the profession? Thank you. And certainly, um, I'm sitting outside of Rochester, New York, so one point that um, I want to mention is that these items can be very costly to train individuals to perform at a higher level, but the cost of having issues in your community is just enormous, both financially, um, politically, and emotionally, like as a form of trauma for the community. So um, another point there um, when we talk about all of these different plan components. On the next slide, uh, Under Sheriff and I just wanted to list out for you who the stakeholders are. So when you're developing these plans with all these important points that uh, your police leaders are going to be the experts on, you have to include stakeholders. So that those are listed in the executive order as including but not limited to. So that means folks, you don't want to leave off anybody that's listed here but you can include other individuals. So we're talking about leaders of the local police force, members of the community, um, emphasizing areas with high numbers of police and community interaction, um, interested nonprofit, faith-based community groups, district attorney's office, local public defender, and all local elected officials. So that's um, essentially the uh, stakeholder group. Anything you wanted to say um, about that slide, under? I think the external part is is so very important, and this is where uh, the 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 cultivation of the relationships that uh, hopefully your law enforcement team has been making in all communities that they serve can start come to fruition and bring folks to the discussion. Uh, and bringing folks to the discussion truly is. Uh, uh, the, the value to this, because as we move on to the next slide, you know, you'll see where that connects. Thank you. On the next slide, um, we're getting into the third stage, what we call the third stage 
of uh, this executive order compliance, and that's Public Comment and Legislative Act. So under the executive order, once you create this plan with the community involvement um, that's built in through the stakeholders, you also, the plan has to be offered for public comment, full public comment to all citizens within the locality. Uh, so if you're doing this in a coordinated effort, that might be coordinated throughout the communities. Uh, if you're handling this individually, it would be within your community. After public comment consideration, the plan has to be presented to the local legislative body uh, for um, action. So the, the legislative body must ratify or adopt the plan, so that can be done by local law or resolution, um, whatever is appropriate by no later than April 1st. Actually, it has to happen before April 1st because you want to get that plan submitted to the state by no later than April 1st. Uh, so that's that's the third stage of this process. Under Sheriff, any comments about stage three? Yes, thank you. Uh, this, is, um, this is the buy-in. Uh, this is where uh, organizations uh, get a chance to listen. Um, and there's, there's, you know, we talked just briefly about, you know, the, the old adage in law enforcement, we know what's best for you versus folks know what they need and what they want, but our future success and how we will grow and move from here is, uh, I feel, uh, particularly, uh, uh, connected to not only getting folks to the table for that discussion, but truly uh, listening to what they have to say and then examining within ourselves in the profession. I can't grow myself and I can't grow my organization if I can't face the things within it that may need to change. And we have to be able to do that. And in this, this is a transparency position. Uh, and, and if we choose not to, or we listen, or we half listen, or we don't truly look at the pieces and maybe make some difficult or painful decisions to ourselves, but for the better good, um, we're going to find that, that, that we're not going to grow from this and we're going to lose some of that transparency. We're going to lose some of those, that credibility that we have within the community that we still do. Uh, so I think it's important that we have that um, that freedom uh, to exchange information and, and a critical look and assessment of what some of that input is and measuring it against where we are, but where we truly want to go. Who, where, where are we now? Where do we want to be in five years, 10 years? And again, all law enforcement organizations are different. They're in different stages um, and, uh, uh, and that's okay. Uh, but this, if it done properly, will help move us along a little bit faster. I really appreciate what you say there because I even noticed in terms of watching uh, counties and other towns, villages begin to plan for this process, a really controlled process at stage three, a really tight time frame uh, for the public comment. Uh, so I, you know, began to become concerned that this wasn't going to be a truly robust process where we're really listening um, and uh, being transparent. So I appreciate what you say there. On the next slide, uh, stage four. So this is how we've broken it down in the four stages. This is the final stage submission of the plan to New York State. So it's pretty straightforward. We don't know the exact process yet that will be coming to us from the Division of Budget um, along with DCJS. I'm sure there'll be forms um, or um, some type of online submission process for the plan. So we don't know what that is quite yet, but you can stay tuned. Uh, we will uh, surely, NYSEC will be providing uh, that information as it comes out, uh, but we've got to get this um, submitted. Um, it's like a certification of some sort that somebody in your organization, I think probably chief executive, police leadership will be signing off on that we've done all the required work and here is our plan for review. Uh, the state budget along with DCJS utilizing uh, probably uh, accreditation standards um, 
an understanding of the different points of the plan that must be reviewed, we'll make determination whether or not our plan is sufficient and if we uh, are in compliance with Executive Order 203. If not, that's where that funding uh, bit comes in in terms of possible loss of funding for your organization. Under anything about uh, the stage that you want to comment upon? Uh, no, all set. Thank you. So on the next slide, you'll see uh, we strongly encourage you to begin your process now if you haven't already. Uh, we hope that one thing that we can teach you is that this is quite a complex process on a very tight time frame to be uh, to be handled properly. And if we're really intending to make the changes that we believe are required, we need to get going on this right away. So just as a little caution, um, you know, really get going on this. Part of this process, again, is understanding of the new laws. So on the next slide, we're going to move into the, uh, the legislative action that occurred in June and how these will play into what you're doing with your plan. So we have about 15 minutes left in our presentation. We're going to move through these rather quickly, um, but I think it's important for you to understand what these are and how they uh, potentially uh, impact uh, as you move forward with your planning for Executive Order 203 compliance. So the first of the 10 pieces of legislation uh, is the Eric Garner Anti-Chokehold Act. So this um, is effective June 12, 2020, already in effect, and it establishes, establishes a new crime of aggravated strangulation for police officers where the officer commits the crime of criminal obstruction of breathing or obstruction of blood circulation or uses a chokehold or similar restraint and causes serious physical injury or death. So most police agencies already have policies prohibiting chokeholds. Uh, this is where strong, good uh, policy and training comes into play. Uh, but if the police agency doesn't have that type of policy, we're really recommending um, that that policy be added immediately as this law is currently in effect. Under any comment regarding uh, that statute? Yeah, I would recommend putting you know, agencies putting out right in their policy that they ban it. That and, and making sure that they not only cover that in their training, but, you know, they have a receipt of said training with, you know, a training uh, uh, a document that they're able to go back and, and show what they did. I think this is very important for a policy statement to put it right out there as quick as possible. Thank you. The next slide um, is the second piece of legislation that we want to mention. It's uh, a civil action for summoning a police officer uh, without reason. So this establishes a private right of action where a person summons a police officer um, or a member, of, they summon the police officer on a member of a protected class. So on a person of color, uh, you know, somebody that they think is an illegal immigrant, um, any of our protected uh, categories, sexual orientation, we most typically see this happening um, with race and color and national origin. So if you don't have a reason, if you allege a crime or an imminent threat um, and that um, didn't have any type of reasonable basis, this is now um, an area where that person could sue you as an individual private right of action. Um, and we recommend that police officers be informed about this new development in the law because both sides of this really need to be careful. This was effective June 12, 2020. Under any comments about this? Uh, yeah, and I th thank you for for mentioning that police officers should be informed uh, because uh, obviously uh, this situation, this these kind of incidents are, are are occurring. We've seen them, we've seen them on television, we we've seen them through the media, um, and uh, making sure that our folks know our policy in situations like this where there's you know an allegation that's unfounded, they need to document. They need to conduct an investigation and they need to document uh, because as it pursues and it goes down the road of civil action, you know, that report, that initial investigation by the officer is going to be very important. Great. Thank you. And yes, this is the, this is the Karen statute. This is how Karen uh, came to be. So yeah, on the next my, slide. I got to tell you though, Carly, that that's my mother-in-law's name. Um, and uh, I have seen a, 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 some some interesting comments about it. So, Karen. So the next slide: New Yorkers' Right to Monitor Act. Uh, this is uh, this is effective already, July 14, 2020. 
A person not under arrest or in police custody has the right to record police activity and to maintain custody and control of their recording device or whatever property they're using to record the police officers. So we recommend police agencies adopt a policy that informs officers of the public's right to record police activity. And under Sheriff, you shared with me some interesting perspective around this one. Would you mind sharing it with the group? Uh, well, first off, um, I think this is a, a, a huge education and, and training piece uh, for our members. Um, we have all watched this also, uh, and we have seen the clips where uh, uh, the, the, the recording device, the phone, is is right there, and folks are are recording. Um, in law enforcement, many of law enforcement now has cameras. We're going to talk about that quick. Um, and they're recording. But I think it's important that law enforcement officers understand their place when it comes to this, because we have situations that have grown uh, into, uh, in, into to violent issues uh, based on the fact that, that officers have felt that uh, folks didn't have the right to record. Uh, so I think that's it's just very important that we educate and train our folks. Thanks. And would de-escalation come in there as well in terms of some of the clips I've watched? It can be very irritating, the person that's conducting the filming um, in certain circumstances. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But sometimes it's actually, you know, kind of uh, aggressive towards the officer in some ways. Would de-escalation come in there in, in terms of how you're training officers to deal with that type of thing? Yes, this is, uh, thank you. Um, this is uh, a significant part of the de-escalation training and also uh, framing out uh, truly where our members should be uh, mentally uh, when they're in the game and stuff is going on around them, how they, you know, maintain their safety and security, but also allow folks to um, have their rights as United States citizens. Um, uh, what the the value here is, is we need to protect their rights to demonstrate and to be unhappy. It's every American's right to do so. Um, but we also know there's a line uh, and the word peaceably com comes to mind. But with that is, is making sure our folks don't uh, uh, increase uh, the, 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 the possibility of violence in an, in an area already covered with, with, with a lot of gasoline. We don't want to be that match. So de-escalation training. Uh, is, I think, uh, paramount and one of those basic foundational principles that we need to start examining. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure how many hours that's dedicated to in the police academy, but I can tell you my professional opinion is whatever it is, it's not enough. And it's something in which we can't just give people uh, in a basic school and walk away from. This is fundamental, foundational, uh, connected to our success, connected to the success of our community and the happiness of members in our community. It has to be revisited continually. Thank you so much. On the next slide, uh, we're not gonna spend too much time on the next slide, we'll just go through it pretty quickly, but so that you're aware of the new legislation, the Police Statistics and Transparency Act, the SAT Act, uh, this requires kind of two things. Um, it's criminal uh, reporting of criminal offenses and arrest-related deaths. Courts have requirements here that they have to comply with to publish aggregate racial and other demographic data of low-level offenses, including misdemeanors and violations. And then police agencies also have a responsibility under the STAT Act uh, to report any arrest-related deaths to CCJS and submit annual reports um, with that same information to DCJS, the governor, and the New York State Legislature. This is um, going to take effect in December, December 12, 2020, and surely there'll be more information coming out about that, including report forms, et cetera. Under anything you wanted to comment on the STAT Act? Just very quickly, uh, you know, as this requires reporting, uh, in the, and it says courts must compile and publish aggregate racial and other demographic data um, of all low-level offenses, I make the strong suggestion that organizations do that and take that responsibility to the next level, take that onto themselves, uh, and, and utilize that for regular quantitative and qualitative uh, uh, analysis to identify patterns and trends 
uh, and, and be able to then utilize that information to determine the necessity of training or addressing issues that they start to see come up. This is important to be on the front end of and organizations, uh, uh, in my opinion, law enforcement organizations need to be on the front end of this and doing this as soon as possible. I love that data informed practice. That's fantastic. The next slide. Uh, reporting police officer discharge of a weapon is pretty straightforward. Um, it it um, took effect just a few days ago, September 13th. It requires state and local police and peace officers, whether on or off duty, to report to a supervisor um, verbally within six hours if their weapon is discharged. Um, under it says under a certain circumstances where a person could have been struck, so at the most circumstances likely. So within six hours, um, there's the verbal report, and then you have to submit a written report within 48 hours. So we really recommend uh, training around this, police department policy updates to make sure that um, the police department is informed of any uh, weapons discharge. Under any comments? Uh, no, no, not at all. Thanks. So on the next slide, a uh, really important development is the right to medical and mental health attention while in police custody. So this took effect in June. On June 15th, it amended the New York State Civil Rights Law to um, make sure that it's clear that individuals have the right to medical and mental health attention while in police custody and establish a, it establishes a private right of action, which will now surely be tacked on. Uh, to other claims against police agencies, whereby an individual who doesn't receive medical or mental health attention um, can file a lawsuit based on, on that alone. So um, important to keep in mind, police officers need to be trained. This is a big training area about the addition of uh, this new law, what it requires, what your department um, expectations are for the officers with respect to the provision of medical and mental health um, and how we expect officers to assist and get treatment to the, in, the persons that are in the police custody. Under Sheriff, comments on this? I think this is just another one of those areas where we have to make sure that our folks understand this. But this is also about supervision. Uh, it's about supervision and, uh, and command. And there's levels of supervision and command on the street or involved in law enforcement every day. And it's identifying these responsibilities of supervisors and commanders in situations uh, in the written directive, in the foundation, and then training our folks. That, that's their requirement to be there and a part of their responsibility to ensure. Thank you. The next slide is a really interesting um, new law. It's requiring the Division of State Police to provide all state police officers with body-worn cameras. And this statute lists out um, the, the points in time when an officer must have the camera turned on. It takes effect um, April 1st, 2021, so the same day that the plans must be submitted. Surely this is going to be part of New York State's plan. Um, it is a requirement now for the state police. But I was really interested in some perspective that the undersheriff shared with me regarding this law. You might think it doesn't affect your uh, county, uh, but in fact it could. Under? Well, you know, I, I am – I. I believe in police body-worn cameras. Uh, I'm going to put that right out to you. I do realize they're extremely expensive, um, but I also uh, 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 am a firm believer that you're going to pay either way. So uh, what my concern here was from a 30,000-foot view is when New York State is uh, has an executive order, which is identifying the New York State police uh, which has jurisdiction of everywhere in New York State, and saying, we believe this is best practice, best policy for you. How is this going to play out for everyone else as far as a comparable standard? Is this what will be measured to? And I think that, you know, that will only be answered in time, uh, unfortunately, uh, in, in court or the court of public opinion. Uh, but I, I do believe that we are at the stage, we're past the stage where we're uh, police worn body cameras, we, we need to uh, move forward uh, to recognize that if there is a choice not to, we have to at least examine what the implication of this is. Thank you. 
So the next two slides, and we'll stay on the next slide, um, but the next two slides are related and very interesting. So um, we'll stay on this slide, but I just want to describe what's on this slide and the next slide. The uh, first here is that the Law Enforcement Misconduct Investigative Office within the Department of Law um, is being created within the state. And that is for the purpose of um, where you could invest, they're going to be having jurisdiction to investigate complaints, allegations of corruption, fraud, uh, allegations of use of excessive force or cases of use of excessive force, criminal activity, conflict of interest, abuse um, of the various law enforcement agencies within the state. So that's a, a new division that's being created as well as an office of special investigation is being created. That's going to be an office within the New York State Attorney General's office, which will also independently investigate it um, and, if warranted, prosecute um, any death of person caused by acts or omissions of police and police officers. So these two new offices are being created. Uh, what's um, extremely important for you to be aware of is that officers, police officers, and um, under this law enforcement misconduct investigative office, if they're aware of any of those things that I listed, corruption, fraud, excessive force, criminal activity, conflicts of interest, uh, they have an obligation now to report those uh, to this law enforcement misconduct investigative office. And if the officer fails to do so, that's grounds for him or her to be removed from their position as a police officer. So it's really some um, policing of police that's going on and this new requirement that police officers uh, report this information. Police departments are also required to report to the investigative office any officer who's named in five or more complaints related to five different incidents within a two-year period. So this is the new arm of law that's going to start to collect and capture information about officers that are having multiple and repeat incidences of um, particularly excessive force um, that would be involved. So we really strongly recommend a police agency adopt a policy, introduce education regarding this duty to report so that officers understand their obligations to act within the law and then also to uh, report when they see violations. This, like uh, the due date for your plan, um, takes effect April 1st, 2021. Under, I know you have um, information to share with us about uh, these new offices that are created. Yes, uh, I, I I believe this this is um, you know the intent that we all see here is is that uh, there's not the belief that we police ourselves well, uh, and um, I am a, a strong supporter of a very robust internal affairs process and unit uh, and uh, within organizations uh, to examine the internal affairs function as it stands and to determine uh, really truly what is the purpose of internal affairs, how does it work within the organization, not only in responding to complaints, but I, I, I strongly recommend uh, in, in building processes within the organization for corruption prevention uh, and examination and observation and the manner in which that we do our job, how we you know uh, uh, look at that data and we qualify it and we quantify it and we turn it into intelligence and intelligence is actionable. Uh, how do we collect data? Is our organization collecting data on use of force? Are we collecting data on the demographics of the force? Are we the temporal conditions? Are we producing a review or an analysis, mind you, of, 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 of um, when is it most likely that use of force is used and by uh, what is the, the, the general description of the people that we normally use force on and who within our organization is the general description? Is it a under five year deputy? Uh, 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 is, it, is, it a ten, is it a 10 year deputy? What is the manner of the force used? Are, are we collecting that and then creating actionable intelligence out of it uh, in order that we can identify patterns and trends and then deal with those patterns and trends. And I think also what's so connected to, to this is um, we also have to have uh, internal courage. And that internal courage to see what must be done is completed 
internally with our own organization and face our members and look at them and say, this is not acceptable. And if you do this, this is what occurs. Um, I came into an organization, a proud organization that's been here since George Washington walked on the earth. And I couldn't be happier to be a part of that. But it was very clear from my sheriff. Uh, and, and I find myself very fortunate, very clear from my sheriff that um, our expectation is the manner in which we serve our, our people in the, in the community will be appropriate, equal, and professional at all times. And when that does not occur, and I'm not saying um, that it won't occur, what I am saying is when it does occur, we will deal with it. We will manage it. We will take them to task. I've, I've unfortunately had to put members of my organization in jail and sought their conviction, and they w did prison time in my own prison. So uh, these are things in which that we must have the internal courage to see through and that robust internal affairs process is the beginning part of that. Thank you. And so on the next slide, you'll see the detail regarding the Office of Special Investigation that I mentioned is being created. So this is the second of the offices that's created under the new legislation. That covers the nine of the 10 new laws we wanted to discuss. And so on the next slide, we'll move into the next area of the presentation, which is the repeal of the 50A. So for many years, uh, the public officer's law allowed covered entities to, so the counties in your case, were exempt, exempting disclosure of records um, whenever those records were specifically exempted by a state or federal statute. And so in New York, we had the Civil Rights Law, Section 50A, which exempted the most law enforcement personnel records. So law enforcement personnel records have been treated in a different way than other public uh, personnel records in as much as they were confidential, not to be released to the public unless they were mandated by a court order um, or by the consent of the police officer who, who was the subject of the record. So special treatment under the Civil Rights Law uh, 50A, which, um, you know, really I think a couple of things here that it, I notice sometimes the police records are challenging in that they haven't been public, uh, that they're maybe not kept um, as neatly as other records. Um, you probably have police records in multiple different locations. So what I have seen is that personnel office of your organization might have certain types of records in a personnel file, and then there are separate internal affairs files. Uh, some organizations, final disposition of internal affairs issues will be moved over to personnel, um, but in other organizations, that's not the case. So there's sort of a mix of what could and should be part of a personnel file in multiple different locations. Uh, many organizations have their training records in a separate location, particularly those that have different types of accreditation. Those training records are reviewed on an annual basis, so those might be in a third separate location. So an important thing to do here is, especially before you start responding to any of these FOIL requests that you've received, is do we really know what the components of our law enforcement personnel records are? So in our county, what do we consider to be a law enforcement personnel record and where are those records maintained? That's really a first step we need to take before we're responding and potentially leaving out different components of information that, that should be responsive to the, to the FOIL request. And I know that there's mass media requests, there's specific requests, different local newspaper reporters are asking for different things right now, given this repeal of the Civil Rights Law 50A. But I did want to mention, you know, make sure that you uh, sit down and comprehensively review what are your law enforcement personnel files, what should they be, what's included, what's excluded. So for, like I said, for a long time, these records were exempt. They might not necessarily be in the best order. Uh, your people who have handled FOIL requests um, may not have any type of access to these files before and don't necessarily what 
uh, understand what's included, what's excluded. So there's a bit of preliminary work and training that needs to go into um, understanding uh, what a personnel file and what the your legal requirements are with respect to responding to FOIA requests. Um, but right now, suffice it to say, what does this repeal mean in a nutshell? It means that law enforcement personnel records are no longer automatically exempt from disclosure. On the next slide, you'll see that even though they're not automatically exempt from disclosure, um, uh, they, they may have some protection. So we're going to talk about that. Before I cover that, I just wanted to um, make sure you understood what a covered agency was under this repeal legislation. So this repeal legislation specifies that a law enforcement agency is any police agency or department of, of the state or any political subdivision of the state, including authorities, um, any agencies maintaining pol a police force, or any individuals going back to that same executive order um, designation, section 1.20 of the New York State Criminal Procedure Law. That's the law that lists out um, who is a, a, you know, a covered a law enforcement agency. So sheriff's departments certainly covered uh, departments of correction um, and any departments of community supervision. Uh, that's all covered by this legislation. Uh, local town, village, police departments definitely covered. Um, local probation departments are covered. Fire departments are covered. Um, and, and certain um, paramedic organizations that employ firefighters uh, may be covered by this. So this is more than just your road patrol individuals that are covered by this repeal uh, legislation. On the next slide. So I mentioned. Uh, there's no longer this automatic uh, uh, protection for law enforcement agency records and law enforcement officer records, but all of the existing FOIL exemptions are still in play uh, for these records, um, and that's something that I think we have to be uh, careful about. There's currently a tension between, I don't know if um, all of you have received uh, correspondence from the different uh, New York State-based unions that represent uh, these types of individuals who are covered, police officer organizations, um, fire protection organizations, but there's been some memos circulating, particularly um, the um, New York State uh, United Patrol Officers Association uh, created a legal memorandum where they maybe are pushing a little bit harder on exemptions and trying to revert back in a way to um, utilizing the exemptions so that um, police records are not uh, discoverable, not uh, revealable to the public. So I think there's definitely a tension there between what these unions um, feel should be the application of the existing FOIL exemptions versus how um, your FOIL officers and your county law department will be looking at um, how to utilize the existing FOIL exceptions. So I just uh, would note that that's an area that you want to be, um, you know, careful about. For example, the police officers associations are pushing a safety exemption. Um, so currently, Public Officers Law Section 87.2, subsection F, it does create a safety exemption for disclosure of certain types of records, but that's really meant to be if a record is disclosed, it would endanger the life or safety of any person. So the unions uh, may be taking the position that um, disclosure of anything about a police officer could become a safety problem because we have, uh, for example, a riot or a protest um, outside of our police department. Uh, that's probably a much too broad reading of, not probably even, that's a much too broad reading of, of that exemption. So that's just an example of, of where I share there's some tensions. If you don't have copies of the memorandums that have been um, written and issued, by the various New York State unions that represent individuals that are affected by the repeal of FCA, it's something that you probably want to take a look at, and I can certainly share those um, with Pat Cummings of, of your New York State Association. So um, the, the, the exemptions that, that I feel are probably the ones that you're going to deal with most often when you're looking at these records. Um, you know, unwarranted invasion of, of personal privacy. Utilizing the same type of analysis that you have always performed 
when you're looking at these types of records and that particular exemption. So other people's personnel files have been requested throughout the years. Other people's uh, files, um, not necessarily personnel records, but settlements, disciplinary records, you know, have been requested. So you're now applying that same analysis uh, to police records. It means that there's nothing special about the police records anymore, that all of the same rules and laws apply. So if there's a particular, I think one important thing for me to say here is, you're looking at not a file as a whole, but really you need to look at each particular record within the file to determine if like there's a personal privacy exemption that would apply. So it is time consuming in that um, you're not able to say, okay, personnel file, put that out. Um, there might be certain things within the personnel file that would be covered by this exemption for unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. And given the posture of the various police unions, firefighter unions, I think we do want to be a little bit careful here in terms of uh, revealing everything when you could end up with a challenge that there was an invasion of personal privacy, particularly in light of the of the the position on this that, that the unions are taking. So that's one area that I think you're going to be commonly utilizing uh, the exemption under its subsection B of the public officer's law. Also, um, so for law enforcement purposes in particular, um, we want to be careful. This repeal legislation stated that we should not be providing any records that if we uh, uh, revealed the records that would interfere with a current law enforcement investigation or judicial proceeding. So there is some checking that you need to do to make sure, okay, if there's this uh, disciplinary record within a personnel file or some type of settlement within a personnel file, could that potentially impact some type of litigation that's ongoing maybe with um, a, a resident or um, with some other agency. So you'll have to check with county law to understand whether or not records, um, are there any particular investigations or proceedings that we should be concerned about um, with providing these records since that current exemption exists and was written into this repeal legislation. Additionally, um, you know, do not disclose anything that would deprive a person of a right to a fair trial or an impartial adjudication. Identify, um, don't identify a confidential source or disclose confidential information relating to a criminal investigation. So depending on what you're providing, if you're providing internal affairs information because there was an ultimate conclusion with respect to that internal affairs investigation, which led to uh, potentially charges and a, a finding of guilt, um, if you're providing that entire record with, that, with your information response, you want to be very certain that you remove any informant information. Um, also, um, you might not want to provide in that instance, sometimes um, during internal affairs process, different sergeants uh, may be interviewed just for background information and their opinion about how a police officer has followed the rules over time. That type of opinion, um, that type of, you know, sourcing, confidential sourcing, that's the type of thing that you probably do not want to be disclosing. And that can, I've noticed in my review of records over the past few weeks, that that type of information could be embedded right in the personnel file. So whoever you have reviewing these personnel files before you provide them needs to understand all of this, needs to be trained, and needs to be sensitive and very careful that they're looking at every single page before it goes out. So, you know, um, I know there's not a ton of resources right now, but moving forward, you know, getting your records assembled and getting them redacted in such a way um, that you can potentially store them electronically so that you don't have to keep reinventing the wheel every time these records are requested. If you have officers that have been involved, have been involved in notable um, excessive force situations, you know, their records are likely to be requested. If they haven't already, they will be soon. So um, those would be the records that I would focus my attention on right now to make sure that all of the redacting that you're doing is proper with respect to the repeal legislation and with respect to the existing FOIL exemption. Another existing FOIL exemption that I think will come into play quite a bit here is the interagency or intra-agency communications, which are not statistical or factual tabulations because that type of thing has to be provided. Instructions to staff that affect the public, so that would be your policies and 
other types of instructions, um, those have to be provided. Our final agency policy or determinations have to be provided. External audits, um, including any audits performed by the state um, or the federal government, those must be provided. But I'm talking about, you know, interagency communications, which can include even like counseling memos. So different types of things that are communicated out um, that are not finally um, disposed of, not fully investigated, those types of things. Um, the police unions in New York State and the fire unions in New York State are, um, you know, really pushing this particular exemption as well. So you just want to make sure that your review is careful around that. Um, on the next slide. So just to be clear, when, um, you know, this repeal um, talks about law enforcement disciplinary records as a record that needs to be provided now if requested, what are, what are law enforcement disciplinary records? So this was specifically defined in the repeal legislation, and these are records which are created in furtherance of a law enforcement disciplinary proceeding. So when we were talking with the undersheriff, it was, we've got this policy, we've got this internal affairs process, and now we're actually going to have that internal courage. We're going to discipline this individual based on the violation of policy or based on the inappropriate conduct. And we're going to move forward with filing charges and having a hearing, whatever that hearing may be, whether it's arbitration or whether it's a town board type hearing in the situation of a town. Um, so you're going to have the hearing and um, there's going to be an investigation that's fully conducted. It becomes part of the disciplinary process and hearing. There's a final action. Um, all of that, all of those documents that go into that are law enforcement disciplinary records. So the repeal legislation says that this includes, but is not limited to, complaints, allegations, and charges against an employee the name of the employee who is complained about or charged with the infraction, the transcript of the hearing. So if there is a disciplinary trial or hearing, the transcripts of that, including any and all exhibits that were part of that hearing, the final disposition. So there's typically a hearing officer or an arbitration report with respect to the disciplinary proceeding and a final written opinion um, or memorandum that's relied upon that imposes, imposes the discipline. So if the uh, disciplinary hearing is only sort of a fact finding and ultimately a board of supervisors of some sort or a town board imposes the di discipline, whatever that final record is, all of that goes into what is a law enforcement disciplinary record. Next slide. So I talked about redactions already, um, but certainly these records will include redactions. The repeal legislation uh, specifies certain items that must be redacted from law enforcement uh, records. So I've listed those here. Uh, there's six specific redactions. Um, I have five specific that must be made and one that may be redacted. So the five specific that must be redacted. Any portion of a record containing medical information. This would not include if there was medical information that was uh, like part and parcel of a misconduct action. Uh, so that would um, not be a required redaction, but any other type of medical information. And personnel files often have a section that's a, a disability type file or a medical file. So you'll want to be very careful that that type of information is not released. And if we haven't been careful about our personnel files, unfortunately, sometimes the medical information is sick notes, et cetera, are, are contained right inside of the personnel file. So this is why I say the person that you have charged with handling these responses should be very careful to examine every page because there could be a document in there that, you know, so-and-so is going to be out for six weeks you know, due to, to testicular cancer. That could be laying right in the middle of a personnel file and would be a real problem if that were released to the public violation of numerous laws, including um, the law that specifically um, uh, struck 50A. So the second um, mandatory redaction is if the officer or uh, firefighter used the employee assistance program, any type of mental health service, substance abuse services, 
um, again, unless that was part of a disciplinary proceeding. Um, and I think we want to be careful here, too, because there are some um, unions that are taking the position that all disciplinary things should sort of be turned into a mental health or employee assistance or substance abuse um, treatment program so that it can be um, kept out of uh, the public eye. So I think we want to absolutely resist that type of position and be very careful um, to look at our IA process to make sure that uh, things that in the past might have been uh, disciplinary charges are not sort of uh, inappropriately concealed as uh, mental health issues uh, or medical issues for police officers. Social security numbers may not be released, so those must be redacted. Um, if you've spent any time redacting personnel files, Social security numbers are unfortunately throughout that file on numerous documents. So you have to be certain that there's no social security number released. That would be a violation of numerous laws, including this law that repealed 50A. Home address, personal emails or telephone numbers for police officers, firefighters, any covered individuals, and his or her family members. So to a lot of personnel files will list uh, emergency contacts, names, addresses, all of that information is a must redact. Um, so the, those are the mandatory redactions. And then technical infractions may be redacted. And the legislation defines what is a technical infraction. It's a minor rule violation by a person employed by a law enforcement agency solely related to the enforcement of administrative departmental rules that either do not involve interactions with a member of the public, so it can involve a member of the public, are not matters of public concern, are not otherwise connected to a person's investigation, enforcement, training, supervision, or reporting responsibilities. So these are like very, very minor infractions, like maybe a dress code um, infraction would be a good example of that situation. Uh, maybe a time in attendance. Um, if it were just by a few uh, minutes or something of that nature, I would say would fall into the technical infraction category. On the next slide. So now um, these next few slides that we prepared for you really get into, we've taken the committee and open government opinions as, as best we can, and we've sorted by what we think are the topics that you're going to have files requested for to answer your specific uh, questions about, well, is this type of police record um, discoverable or not? Um, we have to provide this in response to uh, freedom of information requests. So I'll start with personnel files. I've already talked about this a little bit here. But um, so FOIL, there's no rule right now that says uh, a personnel file is accessible or a personnel file is not accessible because um, for a couple of reasons. Personnel files are different in every organization. There are some common documents. The retirement forms are going to be in there. The new hire paperwork is going to be in there. Um, insurance documents are going to be in the personnel file. But there's all different types of documents that are in the personnel file as a matter of practice or policy. Um, and so you really have to examine every document within the personnel file. And it's not a matter of, OK, here's all of the personnel files. In fact, like I mentioned, the personnel files are going to contain many of those documents that are must redact uh, situations. And so we're going to see some action with people, you know, agencies providing complete personnel files without making the necessary redactions. Hopefully not things like medical information, social security numbers, um, and, you know, home addresses of family members. Though that would be a, a, a problem if that is provided. But so we're looking at each and every document. We're giving initial um, consideration to, you know, probably whether if I provide this document, would there be any unwarranted invasion of personal privacy? But, you know, doing that broadly in favor of the disclosure of the records to the public. Um, also, like I meant to mention, the interagency uh, memorandums, that type of thing, no final dispositions um, uh, would be something that we want to take a close look at. Um, records were relevant to the performance of any type of official duty um, are generally going to be documents that we're going to provide. So any type of record indicating, I just, for example, a record indicating an employee's gross pay and time and attendance, those are probably accessible. Um, records regarding deductions uh, for charitable contributions or 
alimony or garnishments, those are probably not going to be accessible. Uh, those would be unwarranted invasions of privacy. Medical conditions, as I've mentioned, those are specifically discussed in the repeal legislation, but also just generally under FOIL interpretations have been deemed to be um, unwarranted invasions of privacy and unrelated to the performance of a person's official duty. So that's sort of the lens that you're looking at. Each of these documents within the personnel files from. Um, so personnel documents and files, rather, in my experience, contain documents like performance evaluations, so annual performance evaluations, if your agency still conducts them after a certain number of years, assessments, um, so supervisory assessments, counseling memos, and disciplinary records. These are documents that we're typically going to find within the personnel uh, records. So we want to look at all of those records um, and decide whether or not there's a personal privacy issue, is there any other type of exemption, like I said, relying on that interagency um, is probably where things are going to come up. So on the next few slides, I want to get into talking about, you know, each of these uh, specific areas. So if you uh, change to the next slide, counseling memos. Um, counseling memos are very often found in the personnel file. Um, so this would be the type of document that's not disciplinary, they're meant to be teachable, they're giving an officer a warning about a particular type of situation and maybe how he or she could have performed better under the circumstances. But there was no detailed investigation conducted, there was no, uh, probably no internal affairs conducted, there was certainly no internal affairs finding and final disposition when we're talking about a counseling memo. Um, if there is, um, I think you want to look at that counseling memo a little bit more carefully about whether or not um, it's something that should be provided. Uh, but if it's the type of counseling memo I described without all of that process, um, you know, we look at that as probably being an interagency uh, material. So I think what we're going to begin to see is conflict between the police unions and agencies that are disclosing counseling memos. Because I think based on the existing FOIL letters and interpretations, there is a likelihood that most counseling memos would be deemed uh, an interagency material that could have been exempt from disclosure. Um, currently, many of you are receiving negotiation demands from the police union. Um, I think a lot of these negotiation demands for police unions have been written pretty overbroad. But I think eventually one of the things that we're going to get to is the police union wanting to discuss whether or not counseling memos will be provided and what are the circumstances when a counseling memo might be provided, and particularly when um, the interagency exemption could be applied, the unions might want to begin to talk more um, if they can organize themselves and not give you a really broad request to negotiate, but come in on a finer point such as, you know, we really want to discuss how counseling memos will be used, when they'll be used, what type of circumstance they're going to be used in, um, and trying to uh, protect those records from disclosure, if possible, is, is going to be the position of, of your union and the union demands. But it's really falling within this. I see strong support within the existing freedom of information opinions that counseling memos are something that could be exempted from disclosure. On the next slide. Performance improvement plan. So contrary to um, the uh, counseling memos, performance improvement plans, when you look at the existing committee and open government opinions, um, re really regardless of whether these relate to a complaint that came in or just a performance issue that a supervisor noticed, uh, performance improvement plans are considered sort of a final document and available for disclosure under the Freedom of Information Law. So um, I think I uh, wanted to point that out for you um, because that's a, that one's a little bit more clear. On the next slide, disciplinary records. Um, so this gets a little bit, uh, not as straightforward as the performance improvement plan, but disciplinary records. So while a record pertaining to a determination of posing uh, some form of discipline on an employee is likely going to be available, at least part of it is going to be available under FOIL. Uh, the same is not true for an allegation of misconduct or a disciplinary charge that is like still under investigation or where it's been fully investigated but it's 
dismissed, deemed without merit, or does not result in any type of disciplinary action. Uh, those types under the existing Committee on Open Government Opinions, those types of records would normally be exempt from disclosure. Um, and this is where um, many of you are probably familiar with already with the Uniform Fire Asso Officers Association, you know, at all complaint that's um, been moved now to federal court uh, from the New York City area. So it's the Bill de Blasio at all. And this is really the primary gist of that big fight that's now going on um, is the courts, the unions rather, having concern about unsubstantiated and non-final allegations or settlement agreements that were based on unsubstantiated non-final allegations. So the union position being that under existing freedom of information law exemptions, those materials should not be provided by New York City. And so that there's currently a stay on, um, an interim stay on uh, those, those documents being provided. Now, ProPublica has, for the most part, provided a lot of that material already, but that's really the legal issue that's in front of the courts right now and that we all need to be aware of. Many of you may have received notices from your unions that based on this court decision, you absolutely need to halt processing of any of your responses to the Freedom of Information Law request? I don't think so. Um, and I don't really think that that court decision should affect most of what you're doing already if you're carefully analyzing your Freedom of Information request right now. You probably already should be looking at these Freedom of Information Law opinions that I based this slide on where disciplinary records um, that really are, you know, have been looked into, have been dismissed, or without merit or did not result in any kind of disciplinary action against the officer are not records that should be disclosed. One warning I have around that is that, um, and I'm afraid we're going to see more of this, uh, not in under Sheriff Casalia's uh, <laughs> mind or in the Onondaga County, um, you know, what we heard about what they do with internal affairs, but we have to be careful, uh, particularly with smaller departments, about Matters being swept under the rug because things are now discoverable, particularly if there's a disciplinary action that's associated with a complaint that comes in from a citizen ultimately. So um, those are the types of things exactly that need to be provided. It's these items that are, you know, unsubstantiated that already under existing analysis probably were not uh, supposed to be provided. Um, so that was what I wanted to mention about disciplinary records. It's that, you know, how were they viewed? How were they ultimately determined? Are they pending uh, that type of issue? Carly, if I could just uh, interject on that last comment, it was a great comment about um, really the, the 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 written directive foundation for receiving complaints. Uh, and again, uh, as uh, organizations review their process, review their written directive systems, uh, taking a giant look at. Um, uh, organizational integrity. Uh, how does an organization receive complaints? What is the manner in which you define a complaint? Uh, and what are the responsibilities of the members of the organization? Uh, every member has a role and a responsibility to report any kind of conduct outside the pale of professional uh, 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 an appropriate action uh, at, at any time. They have a role of responsibility, and if they choose not to, they will be disciplined as well. And then identifying uh, you know, the, the role and responsibility of each level of the organization, whether sergeant, lieutenant, captain, on up. What, what's able to be handled in the hands of a supervisor, first-line supervisor? You know, I talked about technical uh, violations as, as the state has kind of defined that. What are the things in which that we want handled uh, from from a supervisor versus what are things that have to be have a preliminary examination to determine whether it meets the merits or let's say a litmus test that would then push that to something that needs to be managed through an internal affairs process uh, in, a, in, in a separate uh, investigation uh, that, that would look at that and those investigations that would also yield ancillary issues. Uh, so just as a side note, uh, ancillary issues in the investigative process and internal affairs are so important because, yes, uh, the IA is about the allegation against officer or deputy so-and-so, uh, 
But during that process, and Carly, you hit this and it was so important, I just wanted to identify it again, is that during the process of investigation, you've identified failure of policy. So uh, was there a failure of policy? Was there a failure to supervise? Was there a failure to train? And being able to then take those things out of the internal affairs process and, and really truly go after uh, those uh, issues that caused or, or played a role in, in whatever that incident was that happened to be in front of you now. That's great. Thank you. And I'm kind of wondering, too, and this is all too new to know how these will play together, but when we talk about disciplinary records and the potential for internal affairs abuse, uh, particularly if there's not the strong policy, but sometimes just regardless of your policy, the person in internal affairs, and now with this union pressure about what documents become you know, final, what becomes a disciplinary action, how will that law enforcement misconduct investigative office rule play into, into internal affairs? And will this have to change how we educate internal affairs in as much as an officer's now failure to report information is caused for that officer's uh, removal? Is that like a particular issue for internal affairs? It's just something that I'm kind of questioning and thinking about. Um, we'll have to see how that plays out. So on the next slide, this gets right into the internal affairs files in particular. So um, it's not as simple as saying internal affairs files are do not need to be provided. And I know that a lot of counties have taken that position. Uh, I personally don't think it's that simple. I think it's kind of like what we talked about with the personnel files. You need to look at the documents within the internal affairs file. Where allegations or charges against an employee are referred to internal affairs, to the extent that the allegations are deemed to be unfounded or are dismissed, um, those documents should be withheld. Uh, those are documents that could be an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. They could be interagency memorandum, but they're the exact type of thing that are issue in that New York City court case, the Uniform Fire Officers Association versus de Blasio. It's those unsubstantiated, unfounded complaints. However, there's existing authority under the Freedom of Information Opinions that suggests that any um, anything that is constituted, so anything that there is a final, there's a complaint, there's an investigation, there's a final determination, I don't believe that that same um, personal privacy interagency would apply. I don't believe that that would hold true in those circumstances where the internal affairs recommendation is subsequently fully adopted by the um, employing law enforcement agency. And, and acted upon. Um, I think maybe arguably even if it's not acted upon, um, if it's you know, in process um, after a finding, I think that could be the type of internal affairs information that, that has to be provided. So really taking a look at what do we contain in our internal affairs files generally, um, those types of things have been completely privileged for a long time and we might, internal affairs might have some uh, documentation creation habits that they wouldn't feel as comfortable with if they're being reviewed by the public, which they, they largely will be um, as we move forward. Undershare, if anything to add to that point? No, I think you hit that perfectly. Okay, great. We'll move to the next slide. Um, so I really talked about this a bit, but I wanted to give you at least one citation on the unsubstantiated complaints issue. So um, this is post the repeal legislation. So we have at least one opinion issued uh, by the Committee on Open Government um, found that the law does not require a law enforcement agency to disclose unsubstantiated and unfounded complaints against an officer where the agency determined that um, disclosure of the complaint would constitute an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. It's to sort of back up um, what we've been saying, at least we've got one opinion um, since the repeal legislation. So um, as you're working forward with response to these FOIL requests, you have, I have that. However, you know, I do note there's no strong requirement in anything that we do um, uh, with FOIL that the agency withhold the record. So this is where that tension um, will come in. Will the unions begin to file lawsuits if we don't invoke the unwarranted invasion of personal privacy um, 
exception. I think that's probably what we're going to be looking at as we go forward. So you have to consider your liabilities with respect to transparency versus that invasion of personal privacy. And that's something that you should be making a very uh, po a policy decision on. I've seen that policy decision being made just within the police department or within the sheriff's office. I think it really should be a much larger decision and maybe something that should be included in your shareholders, your stakeholder meetings, I almost said shareholder, your stakeholder meetings with um, your committees to execute on the executive order 203 planning. Um, that I think you want the elected officials um, all should be involved or be able to have some say on whether we're going to take, you know, the full disclosure route versus the, you know, let's pull back a little bit and look at the unwarranted invasion of personal privacy and the kind of liability we face or the kind of um, liability that the release of certain records could create. So I think all of the individuals need to understand the types of records that we're talking about. I have found um, as an attorney, and I think a lot of county law departments are finding this as well, that the uh, elected people maybe don't really even understand what these police records entail. Um, so make sure that there's some type of education class that you create where people understand what the records are and are able to make informed decisions about how they want to move forward in response to these FOIL requests. I think that a lot of decisions are being made without that foundation at this time. So that would be one recommendation that we have for you. Carly, also on unsubstantiated complaints, uh, the language that was used on that opinion was um, the law does not require a law enforcement agency to disclose, quote, unsubstantiated and unfounded complaints against an officer. Um, standard kind of complaint information in, in IA closure of cases uses terms like sustained, not sustained, um, unfounded, uh, exonerated. So what does unsubstantiated mean? Uh, is that does that equate to not sustained uh, and and you know really what the definition is that they're looking for so that organizations can identify what those definitions are in their closing of of internal affairs complaints so they could you know at least have the legal argument that this was not uh, going to be uh, disclosed because of uh, where it fits. Thanks. On the next slide, just a few wrap-up points on the 50A repeal and some practical things to, that you need to be thinking about right now or your organization needs to be thinking about right now. Um, so heavily counties and uh, larger police departments are receiving formal demands to negotiate the repeal of 50A. I mentioned that these are really overbroad. I have some samples if anybody wants uh, a copy I can share with your New York State Association of Counties. Um, some samples, I'll redact obviously any confidential names, uh, but there are these pretty broad demands to negotiate the repeal of 50A. I've also seen a pretty broad response from counties and larger police departments saying we don't have to negotiate the implementation of the law. And so I think we have to be a little bit careful about that because there are some aspects of the 50A repeal that may be negotiable. Like I mentioned, for example, how do we utilize counseling memos? The discipline of an officer is something that is an item that um, can be a mandatory subject of negotiation. So we have to be careful in terms of if we're changing any of our processes, if we're changing any of our policies. Those are traditionally items that unions do have um, some say in terms of whether it's mandatory negotiation of the actual rule or if it's um, the impact of the rule, which is more typically the case they have impact bargaining. Uh, right. Uh, another really good example of this would be body worn cameras. So we absolutely have the right as a police organization to institute the cameras, although some of us have contract language currently that would prohibit that or at least would um, have us uh, meet certain requirements. So you do have to understand what's in your current collective bargaining agreements or any side memorandums that you have regarding body worn camera. But let's say generally there's nothing in your CBA regarding that. Um, you have the right under current curb case law to um, install security uh, type equipment, but when it, if it's going to change how the officer works, the time it takes the officer to get ready, um, those types of items could be subject to negotiation. And uh, definitely we know from existing curb case law, the use of the uh, camera footage 
So footage is probably important for a lot of reasons, but how it's utilized is one of those important reasons. I know that as people are planning their police reform, one of the things that they're looking at are quality assurance type programs where camera footage is audited, sort of like how call center people are audited from time to time, their phone calls are listened in on, uh, reviewed for whether or not the corporation's policies are, are being met. Um, if we're going to plan to use uh, the footage of body cams for any type of discipline or for quality assurance, I think you get into an area of, of possible mandatory or at a minimum impact negotiation. So I think there's a lot of fine points within the 50A repeal where there are items that we, we may have to deal with the union on. Um, if the union's request is overbroad, I think you want to be careful about uh, responding in an overbroad fashion. What I have done in response to those, you know, we, you know, demand to meet with you regarding the repeal of 50A and we hereby, you know, um, you declare that if you release any personnel files or disciplinary records, you know, we're going to file a curb charge, et cetera. Um, in response to something that broad, I think you should write back to the union asking for the specifics. What specific parts of this legal requirement do you believe are mandatorily negotiable? We would like to be able to review that and prepare for that before we sit down uh, to have a meeting with you. We'd also like to understand specifically if you believe that this is, uh, you know, bargaining or if it's impact bargaining. So we sort of put that back on the union to give you a more specific list of the fine points of what they, the topics that they want to negotiate so that you can be properly prepared before you go into those negotiations. And remember, even if it is the impact of body worn camera footage and how it's going to be utilized, whether it's going to be used for the disciplinary processes, all of your Taylor Law bargaining obligations attach to that. That means, what do I mean by that? It means that you have to negotiate fully. You have to meet at reasonable times and places with a mind open to compromise. You'll have to have several negotiation sessions. It leads to mediation and uh, fact finding um, for counties. It wouldn't be an impact. Uh, it wouldn't be uh, something that would end in final binding interest arbitration, but it would go all the way through mediation and fact finding on those topics. So this can be a very lengthy process, and to the extent um, one thing I want to mention is to the extent where we're talking about this in coordination with the Executive Order 203, there's an interesting legal issue that presents with that if you resolve or create a local law that's requiring body-worn camera, camera footage, how it will be used, whether it will be used for disciplinary processes, whether it will be released, now that's a separate legal requirement. Uh, for your locality, and would the union have any negotiation rights with respect to to that local law? So those are all things that you have to be thinking about from a labor perspective as you move forward with your Executive Order 203 compliance and how you handle the 50A repeal and this probably multiple requests for records that you're already handling. Um, and also, we're seeing counties and other large departments receive demands to stay uh, any FOIL responses based on the New York City court case. I think the response there is to write back that if whatever your position may be. If you're already taking the position that, um, you know, all um, non-final determinations and unfounded records are already being carefully reviewed in response you know, utilizing the existing FOIL exemption, maybe that's your response there, but I think you also need to be very careful um, to uh, stay any of your FOIL responses uh, based on a union demand because there is a right to information by the public. So that um, all has to be carefully weighed together. This is what we were going to cover on 50A. On the next slide, I just leave it open for under sheriffs. Uh, Castelia, any final thoughts, recommendations for the group here as they move forward with their compliance with the executive order, with these new laws, and with uh, including the 50A repeal? Well, thanks, Carly. Uh, my, my Just my first comment is a big thank you for all that you do. Uh, I appreciate very much uh, the association 
and uh, as as always, these are these we find ourselves in peculiar times, and and that has uh, impacted the way that we have traditionally come together in in many ways. And professional development uh, is never more necessary uh, than now. And continuing on in spite of all the obstacles. So congratulations to the association for the flexibility and just uh, the uh, truly the, the, the powerful uh, uh, different sessions that they're putting on. So uh, very much appreciate that and being included. And um, I really enjoyed listening to the last part uh, and listening to Carly because I'm jotting down notes and I have things and I know that you're working already with our folks there, Carly, but there's a number of things I want to go over and ask them about. Um, so I appreciate uh, how in depth uh, that information is because we are, we're very concerned and, um, and, and every day it just seems to be something new. So uh, we just have to do what we do and have, and, and have to learn to do better, which is adapt. Um, you know, I've been very fortunate in my career. It's nearly 30 years now. Uh, and in that time, um, I truly believe uh, that this is a noble profession that I find myself in. Uh, I truly believe that that my members do great things every day. And so many of those great things go unseen, unheard. And I do believe that we all uh, can continue to advance and grow as individuals and as a profession. Um, and this is a, just another opportunity to embrace that growth. So I encourage, you know, my 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 comrades, my, my um, all of all of the folks that I work with, uh, folks that I come into contact with, to embrace the opportunity uh, to tackle on and face some issues that ha have just never uh, truly been faced to completion, and and be able to begin that process and to continue because this isn't just about any single issue. This is about overall professionalism in many different areas. We can argue about all sorts of things when it comes to this, but I think we have to get past that and be able to say, this is an executive order. This is going to happen. And not only when you look at all of the different pieces of it, what a great opportunity to continue to grow and professionalize our organization and develop. I've seen a lot of changes in 30 years, uh, and, and this is just going to be one more change that's going to continue to lead us forward so that we can better serve our communities as public servants. Um, so I just wanted to leave you um, with the fact that I do believe, and after 30 years of essentially conflict <laughs> on every <laughs> internal and external pieces, that's that's what we get paid to do. We, as Carly reminded me the other day, we don't we don't get a lot of invitations to stop by the wedding or the birthday unless it's going really bad. Um, after all of that time, and I still believe in the better day. And I know that we can do that and we can do that with you. So thank you for the opportunity. Well, Undershare, this is uh, Patrick Cummings um, and on behalf of NISAC, uh, the, the thanks really go back back to you uh, and, and to Carly. Um, that, was a, that was a great presentation, uh, timely, great information. We have, um, I know we've run over a bit, but if for those staying on, we have a few questions that we definitely wanted to get to um if if both uh the under sheriff and carly have a couple more minutes uh first and foremost the question i'm getting the most is is where and i can i can answer this one where can we get these slides so that we can share these with other county employees we can share these with potential stakeholders um you're going to be able to find this as well as uh all our workshops and and previous webinars on the nisac website um please definitely feel free to distribute these and if you have uh questions um, that follow or others have questions that, that you get from reviewing the slides, send them into NISAC, send them into uh, Carly's information here. We're, we're always happy to help. I work closely with Carly on a lot of, lot of uh, legal issues. So we'll, we'll be happy to answer anything that we don't ask uh, answer today. Um, the first question we got in uh, is a question about the probation department within uh, a county. And that's, um, I know you mentioned that that some some uh, district attorney uh, investigators might um, also be considered policing entities that would be subject to EO203. The question is, do the probation officers uh, do they fall under either either 203 or the 50A uh, sections at all? So the um, 
they're listed in that criminal procedure statute that I identified, so they would fall within both because um, for the 50A and for the EO, uh, the probation officer side. Thank you. Um, I got a question. We got a question also about uh, again with EO 203 and um, the, the the steps that 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 our local police entities need to go through. Is there anything with state police um, that that's either the with the requirements within EO 203 to go through this step process or something similar? Um, is there, to your knowledge, is there anything with the state police? Yes, the state police is also subject to the executive order and they'll be going through their own process. I know that some, depending on the jurisdiction and how they work with the state police, they're including state police as stakeholders in everything that they're doing. Like I said, the body-worn camera is sort of a built-in piece. I'm sure it's going to be a big part of the uh, reform of the New York State Police uh, is the body worn camera requirement as already mandated now pursuant to that legislation. But I have seen um, different counties, different even towns that work closely with different state police units invite them in as stakeholders for part of the plan or at least seek any input if you have like a, I don't know, there's some different projects that you might be working on with state police that you might want their input as you're moving forward with your planning. Some things I could think of. I don't know, I'm sure if 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 um if you have any involvement, um, if the state police has been involved in Onondaga County's program. Yeah, we we have a very close relationship with our troop D uh, here, uh, and uh, we of course invite them to be a part of our process. But we also recognize that they probably will be getting directives in a process out of Albany, so we're we're careful not to not 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 to put them in a position until they, they uh, get all their information. And, and I, I, as of yet, have not been informed as to what their their process will be, but we invited them to be a part of it. Thank you. Um, last question. Um, dealing with the New York State um, accreditation uh, process, can multiple county departments do this, or is this just something for the Sheriff's Department? And um, if they can do this, uh, uh, other departments, do you think that there is an advantage to doing so? So uh, it's for law enforcement based organizations only. So um, town and village police agencies, cities, uh, county sheriff's office, absolutely. Not only uh, 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 can they, but I, I am a firm believer uh, in the process of accreditation in what standards do, whether it's the American Medical Association or the ADA standards, uh, it, it helps uh, drive uh, professionalism in, in the profession itself uh, and, and it brings high standards in truly that best policy, best practice review process. Uh, I'm in an agency that has, that our sheriff firmly believes in accreditation and value we have uh, law enforcement accreditation uh, in, in on the police side. We have accreditation in our civil side. We have accreditation in our correction custody sides. And we even have external accreditations from the American Correctional Association in our jail, which is another 380 standards. And we are in the process of finishing up our CALEA program, um, which has also many other standards also, because we believe that these standards truly help us not only uh, build the foundation in which we act, but then it allows us to continue to examine how we do because a part of accreditation is bringing in professionals to your organization every so many years and then reviewing every year, you know, does the organization uh, meet the standard? Um, do they, you know, they do they talk the talk, but do they walk the walk? Uh, and it's a great way for the CEO of the organization to look back and, and to see where the where folks external to the organization may be identifying some shortcomings. Thanks so much, Under Sheriff. Uh, Under Sheriff Carly, thanks again. Uh, that's going to wrap up this workshop. Um, it was it was a great one, um, and I want to thank our audience. Um, holding tight for almost two hours is a long one for us, but that. I, I, you can see by you all holding tight that what a great information this this was and uh, what a benefit. So we appreciate our members 
tuning into this. Um, I want to thank our, our sponsor once again. And um, we've got a reminder to all that are listening. Um, we've got another web, a NISAC um, workshop coming up at two o'clock on cybersecurity. So I uh, hope to see you all there. Carly, under okay, Sheriff. Thank Hey, Patrick, I'm, I'll be sending you a list from the statutes regarding who's covered, who's not covered, because there's some fine points regarding like the investigators and probation officers that people should be aware of. But I'll send you a little summary and write up of that so that people can have the, the specifics. It's a Sounds little bit hard to dig through on it for people. So I'll, I'll put that together for you. Thanks, Carly. Yeah. Thank you all. Take care.